Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Mark Ronich, and I'm president of Statewide News Service. I run a website, jbiztechvalley.com, and I'm a columnist for The Jewish Press. And uh, Rabbi Simon, who usually co-hosts with me, is on assignment. He's out of town today. And so I'm doing this solo. And with our first guest, uh, our guest today is Dr. Meredy Hancock, the president of Empire State College. Welcome to The Jewish View. Thank you. It's so nice to have you here. You're our first college president on this program. So, <laughs> and I'm glad to break into that territory. You know? There's a lot of wonderful presidents in the area. So because I, I really wanted to talk, I mean, of all the colleges uh, in the SUNY system, uh, this is one of the most unusual uh, for all the good reasons, all the right reasons. Uh, so why don't you tell me about Empire State College and how it's formulated and how you, you know. Sure, a little bit about Empire State College. It was founded with a movement in the 70s where several schools were founded to look at unique ways. And it's interesting because we're a little bit back in that mentality again of saying, what is learning? Does it have to be so rigid? Does it have to be so tight? Is college level learning only for 18 to 21 year olds? And there was a movement in the 70s saying, no, we need to look at what's out there. We need to do things differently. We're missing so many people and we're not counting learning that's happening through life. So Empire State College came around uh, through Rockefeller and Ernest Boyer was chancellor at the time. And their vision in how do you leverage the SUNY system, make it basically a pool full of resources to create mm -hmm. a college that can look at learning as it happens anywhere, anytime, and credential it in a very flexible way. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the founding of Empire State College. Yeah. Now we're the largest SUNY comprehensive college. How so many students? We have a, just under 20,000 students. Okay, and you're the largest? We're, in... the, we're the largest within the comprehensives. So that and what is the, what's the distinction there? That, that would like... exclude the university centers, Binghamton, Stony Brook, okay. Albany, and, and, and Buffalo. Buffalo. Right. And so of the university colleges, as we used to call them when I went to SUNY yes. Albany, uh, yes. the, the university colleges and the community colleges, you're the largest. Excluding those, yes. And I, I don't know their sizes. So out okay. of the New Paltz, the... Yeah, Oneontas, Oneontas Cortland. Those, yes. Uh, yeah, I'll name them all. Okay. Yeah, Buff State. <laughs> okay. We're the largest. So, so are you? Uh, so, t t tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, where did you grow up? Uh, wh you know, what was your deg what was your degree in? Where did you go to college? I grew up all over the place. Uh, we moved quite a bit. I, I teased my father. Uh, retired from the military, but I think he kept kind of that system. Every couple years, I think he thought he was on orders, and we moved. My parents always had a wanderlust, moved around quite a bit. Was uh, he in the military? Or? He was, oh, okay. he was. But even after he retired, we kept moving. They just loved to explore and move. So I won't say military brat, because I'm sure you weren't a brat. No, never, no. <laughs> never. <laughs> but, um, but it gave us an opportunity to move. I was from a large family, so yeah. we, we brought our set of friends anywhere we went. My siblings and I would be best friends when we moved to a place, then we'd separate out as we got to know other people. I went away to boarding school at my own, my own choice uh, when I was uh, in high school. And that, that was a fun, different experience. I think being the youngest, all my siblings were moving out to college and I had decided that I was used to a lot of activity. Were you the youngest? I was the youngest. Youngest yes. of how many siblings? Five. Five, oh, okay. Yeah, five. And where did you go to boarding school? What state? Arizona. Okay. Arizona. And then I went to a very traditional women's college, Scripps College in Claremont, California and match that, I got a wonderful deal to skip a year and get my MBA from Claremont Graduate School. And at that point, Peter Drucker was there, so that's where we all wanted to be. And then I married a military service member, traveled mm -hmm. around a lot, and started teaching for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and was introduced to the non-traditional students. Where is that? It's out of Florida, but I was teaching in their Norfolk, uh -huh. uh, Virginia area, okay. which served as service members. And I was so impressed with these service members who worked a full day, didn't make a lot of mm -hmm. money, were raising families, and decided to go to school. Right. And I fell in love. I just fell in love with non-traditional education. I fell in love with the adult student. I, I tell a story of teaching an economics class, and I was coming straight from the book, but they were coming from the period of stagflation, yeah. which defied economic rationale yeah, I was at that in, point. I was taking economics in college during so, stagflation. So unemployment and, I had a, and inflation. <laughs> I had a Chinese economics professor 
Quen Chen, mm -hmm. I'll never forget him because I couldn't understand him. And I, even if I recorded it and I took it back to my dorm room, I couldn't mm -hmm. understand him. So needless to say, stagflation <laughs> stuck in my mind. Well, yes. and that, I fell in love with these yeah, students yeah. who didn't care about the theory. They didn't care about the Phillips curve. They cared about what they were experiencing. Right, right. And I was so impressed with that drive, I think particularly because my schooling had been so traditional. And that changed yeah. my, my life. My, my background was in finance, but I decided to go to education. Now, when Empire State College first started, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have where you, you know, how did they conduct classes? Because now, a lot of it's through the internet, a lot of it's streaming, right, I presume, or recorded programs that, you know, you could watch a professor who recorded a program, he might be dead, but he could, you but could you still, could still watch, watch him. Yeah. The, the historical distance education was a lot of that. Here are your tapes, watch them, do this homework, mail it back in. Uh -huh. Empire State College, even to this day, is only about 50% online students. We hold a number of um, different modalities. Our faculty will work one-on-one -on -one in kind of a guided independent study with a student. How many faculty do you have? We have a couple hundred tenure track, and okay. then we have several hundred more adjunct. Adjunct. which keep a great balance of the academic practitioner. Those are active in their field yeah. and really bring the practitioner basis. And then our full-time faculty tend to be more theorists. Mm -hmm. So they bring the theory more to their field. So it's a great experience for a student to get both. But then we have small group classes. We don't have any classes over probably 30 students, regardless of how we do it online or face-to-face. -face. And like I said, a number of small groups, five, 10, and then we do residencies, so we'll bring students in. They'll all uh, descend maybe on Albany to do a residency around wellness in different areas of that, or they may do it around history and hit the battlefields. They may do an art uh, re uh, residency down in New York City. And they come in from all around the country or all around the nation, all around the world? They can come in from all around the world. Mm -hmm. Largely, we are largely a New York-based oh, okay. You don't have too many out-of-state students. Not, not a lot. Okay. Military. And then yeah. we have international programs. But the vast majority is around New York. Oh, good. And we take that, yeah. the fact that we're a state institution seriously. Mm -hmm. We work hard to hit New York's needs. We don't do a lot of recruiting out-of-state. Do you, and how long have you been president of the president? Three years this summer. Three years. So wow. Almost three years. All right. Well, you're doing great things even in that short period of time. Uh, how far, how much further have you taken the uh, the video part portion of the... The online portion? Yeah, the online portion. Ironically, we're almost backstepping a little bit in the industry. It used to be very much you had face-to-face -face and you had online, and you wanted online to mimic the face-to-face -face experience as mm -hmm. much as possible. And now with the technology, we're really blending it a lot. Because so can't you go to, like, let's say, an, a local library that would have video conferencing? And that could be in several different locations. I mean, SUNY does their board, yes. mem their board meetings, meetings that, way. that way. And we are, in our new buildings we're doing it, we've gotten some funding from the state to up our video conferencing piece. You know. And so that's a piece where it's moving backwards. That's a synchronous. That's a backwards move? It is a bit for education. Oh. There was a while where it was anytime, any place. Everything was asynchronous. Uh -huh. And the students pushed back a little bit, saying, we want the flexibility, but we also want the connectivity. And now we're, we're moving between the two. So okay. we're keeping parts of it where if you happen to like to log in at 2 a.m. Yeah. and do your work, you can, and all mm -hmm. the materials are there. Uh -huh. But another part of it that says, here's a couple times we're all going to come together oh, okay. I see what in video okay. conferencing. So a hybrid model is emerging. We see students do better in it. Yeah. They form stronger student-to-student -student and student-to-faculty cohorts. Uh -huh. So it's interesting. We're moving the clock back a little bit. I think we we you know moved one way real strong mm -hmm. in, in education and now we're saying wait best practices really give students more of a choice in each course they can move mm -hmm. in between during the course now i have to tell you i know you know you know that rabbi simon's not here yes but his wife uh, just received uh, in may of may of last year mm -hmm. uh, a bachelor of arts in community and human services with a concentration in the nonprofit sector Yes. Uh, what would a coursework in the, with a concentration in the nonprofit sector be? Because I look at that as fundraising. I, it, you know, but it also looks you know, on the legal side, you know, the 501c3, what does it mean? How do you file the forms? A lot of it depends on the student. 
And we do a lot of individualized programming. So our faculty, when a student comes in, they meet with a faculty member and they spend a lot of time talking about what they've done. So part of what that does is help figure out who you are. What have you done? What's that body of knowledge you bring? The vast majority, 98% of our students have taken classes somewhere else. So they have the traditional transfer credit. But they also have life experience. Maybe they were in the military. Maybe they were a first responder. So they have some credit for things mm -hmm. we know they've learned. And then there's other things. They could be a history buff. And they've spent, maybe this is a 40-year-old student, they've spent 20 years studying mm -hmm. history and visiting battlefields and doing reenactments. They're not going to get a lot out of a History 101 course. Right. No. So instead, they can Except write... an easy A. Maybe. An easy A, that's yeah. true. And it would ironically be easier for them to take the course, probably. But they can write that up and document their learning and get credit through it so they don't have to repeat what they know. So depending on where she came from and what she wanted to do, then fills in the gap of her program. Mm -hmm. So maybe her nonprofit leadership is not so much in the fundraising side. Maybe she really wants to be a grassroots organization. Well, when you look at human ser community and human services as the major, you can get the sense that it's... It, you know. it could be anywhere. It could be community health could be a focus right. that she's really taking in education. Yeah. She's very focused on the education sides and... She's on the board of Jewish Family Services, so... Of, so it would probably you know. be around those areas yeah, right. and what her focus is. So it could to have make, a stronger fundraising or a smaller fundraising. It and could to have, make the organization stronger to have someone... Yeah. Yes. It could have a policy aspect. It depends on her needs. So there was an article in in the uh, local paper here, Powering into the 21st Century. You know about this article? Have I do know about that? that article. Okay. Uh, so it says that Empire State College reorganizes to share academic expertise. So you're sharing academic expertise? I mean, what's the point of uh, what you were trying to get? What was the, oh, it says Empire, SUNY Empire, you're called? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was founded in 1971. Yes. Okay. So, so we originally, when we were founded, part of the goal was to be in these remote areas of the state. And that was, so we founded on a regional model and then built up through the regions. And in doing so, we created pockets of academics, but we didn't share across a discipline in the state. And we have 35 locations across the state, mm -hmm. so we've got faculty distributed all over the place. Now, you have a, an office in the concourse of the Empire State we Plaza. Do. We do. And are there classes taught there, or what is that office for? It's largely for recruitment and for students to meet with faculty members one-on-one. -on -one. So they'll hold some events there and some I classes, see. some small group studies. But if a student needs extra help and meet, wants to meet with a teacher, the teacher goes to that It's even, think, pod. think very much out of the box of how you did your studies. Yeah, right. Our students spend very little time in the classroom. Right. The bulk of it, the learning they do in a, in a learning contract mm -hmm. with their faculty member. Right. So a lot of it is sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, and it can be quite intimidating if, because it's only the student, sometimes with the faculty member, and they have to maybe compare and contrast books within a genre they've read. There's no hiding behind the back row. So when they come in to meet with the faculty member, they may spend an hour going over an agreement of what they said they would learn and uh -huh. talking to the faculty about it, what they learned, what they discussed, what they, how their paper went, how their research project went. So it's not the traditional, I need some, I didn't understand this part of economics. Okay. It's saying, I, now I'm going to discuss my comparative analysis of capitalist um, economics with socialist mm -hmm. economics in a one-on-one -on -one discussion with my professor. Oh, okay. And, but that could have been done over Skype. It could have been. You know. it, and some students do it over Skype. Some mm -hmm. students do it virtually. Um, through various other modes. Some students do it one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member. Heaven forbid member. we should pick up the phone and talk, Some students talk, do it you know? on the phone. No. <laughs> Notice I'm still doing that's, this. That's right, you know? that's right. You're not, you're not doing this. <laughs> no, no. Well, rotary, you that's know. So. No. Um, so what would you, where would you like to see Empire State College grow to in the years? Because you're, for, you're there for, I mean, Empire State College is 45 years old. Mm -hmm. So I did the math in 1971. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the next five years, let's say, it's so when you celebrate the 50th, what, where do you like to see Empire State College grow to and be a symbol of? I want Empire State College to be the symbol of, there's, there's a track that's gone into non-traditional education and it's very heavily focused just on credentials and largely just on employment credentials. 
And then there's this liberal arts track, and that tends to be for the more um, fortunate person who has the time or the money or both and can really study a liberal arts track. And, and Empire State College is this rare opportunity in non-traditional education to bring them together. Right. That we have a strong, strong liberal arts core and a real strong non-traditional focus. And that's what you have now, but that, where do you want to so see So in five it? years, I want to see people realize that that can be done because the two are seen as mutually exclusive. You can educate non-traditional students and kind of hammer them out. And you can do an in-depth liberal arts education, which some people believe does not prepare you for a job. I want people to understand it can be done, how well it can be done. And I want Empire State College, while we're doing a great job now, mm -hmm. I want us to improve on yeah. how well we're doing it. No, exactly. Do you want to grow from the 20,000 students do. to what might be your goal? But you know, as the chancellor so frequently points out, there's over a million undereducated adults in this, just in this state. To say we're only hitting 20,000 of them. In your particular school, yes. Is, is appalling. <laughs> <laughs> so now not everybody wants an education, not everyone needs right. to complete their degrees. But I, I don't know if I have a number. I've tried really hard to stay away from we will be 30,000, we'll be 40,000. But I don't think we can say we're answering the needs of the state if we're not growing. Uh -huh. That's true. That's but true. We, and you know what? You can grow as large as you want to grow. You're not stymied by a land or by the number of dorm rooms. I mean, you know, it's amazing that you could have well, no, every SUNY school can be part of Empire State College. Well, and because of our faculty respecting learning in so many modes, you don't have to have taken it from our school by our faculty for them to respect that you actually learned. Right. That enables a lot of flexibility, too. Our students do not take that many courses with us. Mm -hmm. they, we have a 25% residency requirement. Most of our students transfer in at least half of their program. Uh -huh. So that helps a lot on the scale oh. as well. It's, the timeliness on ours is that part of working one-on-one -on -one with a student to say, what do you want to study? How yeah. committed are you to this? Our method takes a lot of commitment from the student. It's not the easiest way to go. So, so I'm only 37, but I'm out of college 36 years. Mm -hmm. That's, that works. I'll do the so, math. <laughs> so if I'm out of college 36 years, I can only imagine that the coursework that I took in the late 70s, early 80s is probably a little outdated by right now. So it depends on so which I coursework that was. Well, journalism, communications, and yeah. probably, I, I mean, I probably couldn't transfer too many of my credits over to a master's program or whatever. Well, master's programs have, have lifespans around them. The, av or the norm yeah. for master's programs is a seven-year lifespan. Yeah, Undergraduate um, do not tend to have those same lifespans. So it's really important for the, for the college to work with the students. Say, if you want to work in journalism, yeah. you're going to have to take some, upgrade your journalism skills and bring them into this decade. Yeah. <laughs> so, or century. It's yeah. Or century. So it's working with the student. We have a lot of that in technology where people took courses, but that technology is so old that when they come back and say, I want to apply those, I say that's, that's not going to meet the requirements for the major because you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to be equipped to go out and work. Now, if it's a literature program, mm -hmm. if it's a history, right. you know, those things can stay Moby that Dick knowledge is, is Moby what, Dick. Moby you know? Dick you know, <laughs> until we lost Pluto, that's astronomy right. was astronomy. astronomy that's right. <laughs> so those things can pass over yes. more quickly, but a lot of it depends on the goal of the student. Mm -hmm. What would you... Uh, okay, you mentioned the chancellor, mm -hmm. and she appointed you. Yes. The board confirmed the, you. Yes. The chancellor has announced one more year, and she's leaving. This must be a sad time for you, because you must have a bond, woman to woman bond, or some you know academic to academic academia bond. I mean, there's so much. You know, is it a sad time? No. No. No, it's really not. I. Luckily, in today's world, you can never get away. I'll be able to find the chancellor anywhere she goes. So she's been a great mentor. She's been a great friend. Wherever she is, I'll be able to pull on that. You know, those pieces don't go away. I'm fortunate I came in a time when SUNY has such a strong and vocal 
chancellor that has has really set some high goals. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the pieces, you know, Nancy has a couple of sayings that I love. Nancy one, Zimfer, who's Nancy the Zimfer, chancellor. Yes, right. one of them is it's okay to fail as long as you fail forward, and and that's a culture that more of us need to take. Take chances, but if you don't learn from a mistake, it was just a mistake. If you learn from it, yeah. you can excuse it a bit and keep moving forward. In so, the business world, it's called failing upward. Yes, so failing <laughs> upward. So <laughs> Failing forward, okay. It, so it's the same. Yeah, you, yeah. you need to learn out of that and take some chances. But the other piece is she's pushed hard on accountability. If you're not willing to measure what you do and you're not willing to say you're going to work to be better, Mm -hmm. how, how can you go after, how can we go to the state for funding, how can right. we go um, to legislators, even Department of Ed for regulation that works for higher ed. So she's really instilled a, a real strong culture of risk taking but accountability, mm -hmm. it, you know, the hand, the hand holding between the two. So, so I think my time has been, I'm lucky I got here, yeah, yeah. that it was good timing for yeah, it. And you're so young, so you know, you've got a, many more years if you want to stay, I guess. And, that's, you know, that's terrific. Um, I just, you know, I, I guess the SUNY 2020 thing, I guess she'll be invited back for in <laughs> four years or whatever. Yes. You know, three years when mm -hmm. she leaves. So, you know, I thought she'd stick it out just to s say this was my uh, crowning, my, mm -hmm. you know, th this is my legacy, you know, and I, I we completed it, but. Uh, well, I believe it'll yeah. stay her legacy. I, th I think yeah. no matter what happens, she will have left a great legacy on the system and the state. So that, that will stay. But, and giving a year, she provides a lot of time for a smooth transition, yes, for a yes. thorough search. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, so, so that's... You know, that, I'm glad that she didn't just say, well, okay, it's time. Yeah. No, I think and it completely going... shows her dedication to the system, to the state. I think she's the fourth chancellor that I've been through. As in my reporting, my journalism mm. career. I started with Clifton Wharton, yes. <laughs> way back when. So and that. that's, no, I, th I think she'll leave a great legacy. And, yeah. and you know, my guess is we haven't heard the last, for, even if she's retired, I think she'll be helping to influence. Her passion early is around K-12 education. Mm -hmm. So you know, educating the teachers that educate the students. Yeah. So I think we'll continue to see more of her Because when I Because when I went to college, the first thing that my teachers told me is, you people just don't know how to write a sentence, a thought, a, a paragraph. You don't know how to write. And I, how, what are they graduating? Why are they graduating you and throwing, thrusting you on us? You know? and, and we, yeah, I think every generation says that the new generation still doesn't know it. how to write. I, yeah, I still hear that from the professors. We, you know, who, we just forget that people said it about us. <laughs> As well, so. You know, I've always kept that in mind, and I'm a very good proofreader. That's so I always know when there are mistakes, and uh, you know, people don't know how to write, and they don't know how to proofread, and they don't take, you know, our language, we only have one language, English, mm -hmm. and we should take pride in that. You know? And, and we, need, we need to push it more, but it's easier, you know, this, this is going off on a tangent, but it's no. very hard with, with non-traditional students, with students where English is not the home language, we take a lot of things for granted. If you grew up speaking, my mother corrected us at every turn. Yeah. If I, you know, she was, uh, I was raised with the grammar police. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since and I, that since much I was better speaking. for it. Yeah. And, and so it sounds correct. It has that cadence to me. But I have friends that did not grow up in English speaking homes. Mm -hmm. And they don't have that benefit of just knowing it doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. And we put them in one English 101 class and wonder why they're not competing with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. hard. How many English classes and writing classes do you have them take? And then they go home and it's not reinforced. The double negatives and noun verb disagreement is what's reinforced at home. So it's a tough, it's a tough those, battle to get in front of. Those double negatives, I get people on that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, so then you want me to do that? Yeah. <laughs> and they go, yep. well, what? I didn't say that. I said, but you used this negative and this negative, so now you want me to do this. And I've been doing this. And, <laughs> and, and it's hard if you did they, pronoun noun agreement. Yeah, if you don't, uh -huh. mm -hmm. if, you don't. <laughs> if you didn't grow up with it, most people don't you know, diagram so, a sentence before they write. So you're a doctor, PhD doctor? Yes, PhD, okay. yes. And what was that in? Urban services. Urban services. Urban services. So you. Do you use that in your role at Empire State College with Saratoga Springs, and which is where you're based? And 
Do you have any connection with the city? Yeah, I think or is that not Saratoga urban enough? would not call itself urban. <laughs> I'm not sure how they would take it if I said I have a PhD in urban services and I'm here to help. <laughs> I, but I, I do like working with the city. I'm on the United Way board for the capital region. Um, but I use a lot out of those pieces around the evaluation, program evaluation, the finance side of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, my or my grad is an MBA and finance is kind of yeah. runs through it. Well, which is but great for being president of, of a college because it's all about the money. In today's world, it In today's is. world, you know, it so it's all about is. the money. So I wanted to, uh, so who would you say your mentor is? Do you have a special person who? I have to tell you, I'm not real loyal. Mm -hmm. I'm a situational mentee. <laughs> But I, I do have a couple folks. My previous president, um, two presidents at Central Michigan University were, were good mentors to me. I tend to feel people out a bit. I, I can, okay. when there's somebody who I think, well, I could learn from that person, I, I tend to figure out how to kind of side mm -hmm. up to them and watch what they do and okay. pick up a bit. So I, I think I have a whole playing deck <laughs> of mentors. You know, I, I was at first night in Saratoga, and I, Empire State College opened up their campus yes. for a couple of the comedy events or magicians' events and yes. you know things like that. So, did you go? I did go. Okay. I did go, but it was so crowded they almost wouldn't let me back in my building. So, but it was which <laughs> it was is a sign crowded. of a great success, I think. A lot of a lot of activity this year. <laughs> What's the largest room in Empire State College that you have? In seating. Yeah. Probably, probably one to two hundred, yeah. which we don't. Like I said, we don't hold any large classes. Exactly. So that would be done for other meetings or conferences and mm -hmm. things like that. Do you hold other events? Do you have unique ways of bringing in money into Empire State College? Do you have naming rights? Do you have other? We do. We haven't leveraged much of it. Okay. So we have a new vice president for development who's working on that. Oh really? So, okay. Yeah. So that's a. You know, so we might see a Mary Lou Whitney. Uh, we we would happily see a Mary Lou Whitney, Whitney Center Wing for Distance something. Education or something like that. Yeah. That's right. So you have your, and mm -hmm. the, or the Stewart shops are in Saratoga and yes, and, the and they're very family. supportive they of scholarships. Yeah. And yes, they are very supportive with scholarships with our students. And Susan Dake is on our foundation board. Well, then unlimited ice cream for everyone. We haven't gotten. Ice cream. I, have, I have to ask. I have to push. Uh -huh. Is there anything that you want to mention that we didn't talk about or I didn't know enough to ask you? Um, no, I always you appreciate our... bragging on the college. Yeah, so it's well. anytime I get the opportunity, I'm thrilled to do it. Well, you know, it's a, how do you get along with Skidmore? Or are you two different worlds? Are you worlds apart? Or? We are two different worlds. But um, Phil Glotzbaugh and I sat together and did uh, the Ivory Tower briefing up there. You know, my, it's funny because my alma mater is very much like Skidmore, Scripps College, a small liberal private arts, uh, or private liberal arts women's college. But uh, my focus right now is access, affordable education, access, mm -hmm. bring it to this, the students who really need it, where they need it, and how they need it. And so we are in different areas a bit. But it's nice because we, we come together at different events and I think kind of accentuate the difference that we cover different aspects on higher ed. Do you have any famous alumni that we don't know about that have taken courses uh, or de received degrees? Uh? We do, we do. We have several um, Olympians, several folks uh, who use it in the flexibility um, so Je they can Jeff Blatnick. Parts. I mean, I think of Olympian, I think of yes. the Capital District, I think of Jeff Blatnick who passed away. but. Is you know? Uh, do you have any names off the top? Um, we have Aaron Young, who was in the last um, in the last Olympics, mm -hmm. and um, and I am drawing a blank, unfortunately, okay. on on our others right now. But it, really, with athletes, with folks who have a lot of travel, yeah, and they tend to do, you know fit into them, they can complete their education. Well, that's terrific. So continued success. And I hope you have many years at the helm of Empire State College. <laughs> thank you, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, keep up the good work. So Great, thank you very th much. Thank you for being on The Jewish View. Thank you.